uh, well uh, dear friends welcome to the 18th joint aligarh society of history and archaeology that is asha and ganga jamni lecture on our shared past and its historical sources today we have a scholar who teaches at university of exeter uk but has origins in the indian subcontinent his paternal family comes from alhabad in up and husainabad in bihar while from his maternal side he has origins in a gujarati family settled in zanzibar he truly represents a cosmopolitan background dr sajjad rizvi is an associate professor of islamic intellectual history and the director of the center for the study of islam at the university of exeter an intellectual historian who specializes in the history of philosophical traditions in the mughal safavid period he has published two books on the philosopher well known philosopher mulla sadra shirazi who died in 1636 his interests extend to the study of mysticism Quranic exegesis, as well as the nexus of poetry and philosophy. He did his BA uh, from history and MPhil in modern Middle East studies from Oxford. His PhD was, however, completed from the Pembroke College at Cambridge. He is currently. completing two monographs one on a diachronic study of discourses on time in islamic thought and the other on philosophy between iran and north india in the long 18th century i came in contact uh, with sajjad at the shia institute at london for the first time in 2016 where both he and i were the fellows and participants in a symposium which was held by the institute in his talk today he will examine connected intellectual histories of shi scholarly networks in the early modern arabo persian cosmopolis he is going to present four case studies two from deccan and two from north india that exemplify uh, the uh, notion of shi scholarly networks and connections between india and other parts of the muslim world welcome dr sajjad rizvi over to you sajjad Uh, thank you uh, uh, professor nadeem rizvi and um, uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be part of this series um, thank you for that very um, generous introduction as well um, just to say that uh, what uh, when you of course asked me to speak i was kind of wondering what i could speak about um uh, since i don't consider myself to be in some ways a conventional historian i i'm much more interested in history of philosophy in particular uh but then i thought i could speak on something which connects with some of the work i've done in different uh, periods in early modernity um and also that i could say something which uh links to a certain extent with uh my project on the 18th century Uh, the project in the 18th century is very much about philosophy uh not necessarily about theology um but there are some important overlaps and um and i guess the third reason why i thought i would uh, pick on something like this is because it falls within 
uh, you know, what I'm calling connected uh, intellectual history. Um, it's becoming very common, you could say, nowadays for people to focus on this particular theme. Um, and, um, uh, you know, looking at how it is that uh, we understand connections, not just across um, South Asia, but also understand how those connections um, work with um, adjacent um, regions and how, in a sense, by looking at connected intellectual histories, we can overcome some of the parochialism of um, nationalist historiographies, right? So nationalist historiographies, whether they are Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, but also um, Iranian, um, Afghan, uh, um, and with all the other um, successor states that we have in, across the Middle East, um, South Asia, East Africa, Southeast Asia, and so forth. So that was very much the thinking behind it. The original title I gave you, of course, was misleading, transnationalism. I, I really don't think transnationalism works in a pre-modern period anyway. Um, but uh, that was also, in a sense, a useful uh, hook to find people because uh, transnationalism is something which is used extensively nowadays in the uh, study of uh, Xi networks, the idea of the Xi international. Um, uh, so when people talk about uh, contemporary Xi thought in the world, they talk about certain types of Xi internationals. They talk about uh, the connections um, which came out of the Da'wa party in Iraq, which connected people into Lebanon, even into parts of South Asia, uh, certainly into Iran, uh, into the Gulf, um, into the Persian Gulf, uh, but also the important internationalism, which really began in the 70s, and uh, you know, especially with the Iranian Revolution in 1979, uh, which brought back about a quite a radical political theology um, in a Shi context, and how then that notion of um, uh, Shi intellectual life, authority, political theology has then been disseminated around the world um, by the Iranian revolutionaries. So going into, of course, into Pakistan quite extensively, going into India, of course, even extensively in parts of Kashmir um, and, uh, and, and far beyond. Uh, so that uh, those two elements of Shi internationalism and transnationalism are, are things which I'm sure many people will be familiar with and how it is that they link communities in South Asia with uh, predominantly Persian Arabic speaking communities and other communities beyond South Asia. Okay, now, um, so that's in a sense setting a bit of a scene. Um, do we now have the PowerPoint so we can proceed? Yes, okay, cool. So, um, uh, so if we can uh, begin um, with the first slide. Um, I was, as I said, this is very much an exercise in connected intellectual history. So <clears throat> what I'm broadly speaking not doing is looking at how it is that um, aspects of material culture uh, connect uh, Xi communities and Xi inflected communities in South Asia with others. So I'm not talking about the material culture of commemorations of Karbala and Muharram or Imam Bargas, Husseiniyas, Karbalas, um, these spaces of um, communal uh, memory and um, uh, commemoration. Nor am I necessarily looking at the uh, patronage of monuments, um, of which there are very many, of course, we know in. Uh, in the Deccan, in Hyderabad, but also in the north, we think of the various Qadamgas. There are plenty of Qadamgas dotted around um, the South Asia, Panja Sharifs as well. Um, I think one of the most um, unusual Panja Sharifs I ever came across was up in the mountains near Kohat in the frontier, uh, what's known as Khaybe Pakhtunkhwa in Pakistan now, where uh, there was this kind of uh, rock formation which looked like a handprint on the side of the mountain. And that's uh, one example. Then, of course, we are familiar with the ones which are in um, in Delhi itself. Uh, and, of course, um, in Hyderabad, in Sindh, uh, there is a famous Qadam God there as well. And there's many others um, through, dotted throughout. Uh, nor am I looking at uh, connections through, um, you know, wide aspects of what sometimes is called Persian culture with respect to dress, with respect to food, with respect to comportment and the wider notion of other 
but rather I guess I will be really talking about individuals and I will be talking about um, literary practices, literary practices and texts. So that's just kind of to set the scene of what it is that I'm not doing. So moving on, um, the next slide. Um, uh, I just want to give some definitions about how we might think about these things before I, I tell you a bit more about the structure of what I will talk about. So by intellectual histories, uh, we're talking about uh, polycentric and multilingual transmissions and production of knowledge. Uh, that's absolutely central. Um, uh, transmission and production, quite simply, because it's not always just about production. The the internal claims are always about transmission, as we know. Um, a, a lot of um, pre-modern um, intellectual uh, cultures are based on the idea that they are uh, merely glossing or merely transmitting or imitating work in the past. They're not always focused very much on saying that this is something which I've come across, which is new but rather they're connecting and they're perpetuating what they consider to be a tradition. And that uh, is true uh, whether one's talking about uh, intellectual rational pursuits or whether one's talking about more scriptural ones. So we're interested in uh, networks, we're interested in discourses, not, not yet, <laughs> I'm still on the previous um, slide, thank you. Um, we're interested in networks, discourses, contexts and texts, which can connect these sorts of languages and centers between North India, West India, and the Deccan, across uh, Indian Ocean systems, uh, across the Arab Peninsula, uh, the importance of Yemen, um, but especially the Hejaz, the, um, the the two cities of Mecca and Medina. And then, of course, one thinks of Central Asia, the important centers of places like um, Bukhara and Samarkand, uh, Samarkand in particular, Iran, and beyond. Uh, and in fact, uh, with respect to um, a lot of the intellectual traditions in South Asia, whether they're in Shi context or not, uh, there are two places which uh, stand out. A third, if we include the scriptural sciences, which are essential. One is Samarkand in Central Asia. The other one is Shiraz. So if one's interested in things like mathematics, um, astronomy, uh, philosophy, um, philosophical theology, um, logic and so forth. Um, Samarkand and Shiraz are absolutely central. Um, and uh, if one's interested in things like Hadith um, and uh, the transmission of uh, narratives of the Prophet, and importantly what I mean is uh, Hadith not just in the Sunni tr tradition but also in the Shi traditions, then Mecca and Medina become quite significant as well. And, and these are the, the three kind of centers which uh, intersect with important places in North India and the Deccan and also West India, by which I predominantly mean Gujarat. Um, and uh, so it's important to, to link these places up. And I guess one of the reasons why we might also want to do it is not just to break out of the parochialism of nationalist historiographies within S South Asia and within Iran, but also the way in which uh, we tend to look at the world of Islam as being centered on the Arab lands or on the, what sometimes are called the central um, Islamic lands, which, uh, you know, basically um, Egypt to Iraq, right? Um, and, and actually to suggest that in terms of what is happening intellectually, especially in this period from, say, uh, 1400 or so to 1800, um, it is not that area between uh, Egypt and Iraq, which is dominant, but actually a slightly different area, uh, one which I guess you might call, describe as, um, you know, in, in the late Shah of Ahmed's book, he talks about the Bengal uh, to Balkans complex. Um, uh, but generally the idea of, of um, the space between the area between Istanbul all the way down to the, the Moluccas um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and that is really the engine, the intellectual engine of what is happening a lot in the the world of Islam. And uh, not surprisingly, that's also where most of the interesting things are happening within uh, one's understanding and um, um, appreciation of what's happening with Shi intellectual history as well. Okay, now uh, this is the structure of what I want to talk about today. Um, so. First of all, I'm going to just say a couple of things about the key concepts which I've mentioned um, in, in the title. The first one is this notion of Arab-Persian 
Cosmopolis. And I want to actually suggest that it might be a useful alternative to term two terms which are very common nowadays, one of which is Persianate and the other one is Indo-Persian. Um, and I want to see how maybe we can um, uh, think a bit more broadly about this particular way of looking at that space between um, Istanbul and the Moluccas. The second one is to look a bit more at what the nature of Shi Islam is in South Asia, some of the early uh, centers and encounters. And within that uh, uh, context, look at the significance of the Deccan. Um, I think increasingly people are aware of the importance of the Deccan. Uh, there's a recent book by Roy Fischel um, on the Deccan. There's also um, Emma Flatt's recent book on the Persian cosmopolis with respect to the Deccan as well. And so, you know, for a long time when the Deccan was very much, study of the Deccan was was very um, neglected, you know, ever since the work of Harun Khan Chirwani, there's really not been a huge amount of work on those sorts of intellectual um, endeavors. And then uh, something uh, further about what the nature of these networks have been and how in particular they link up with the, the Shia shrine cities. Um, one thinks especially of the shrine cities in Iraq, um, which in much of this period was actually under Ottoman control. Um, but also uh, looking at uh, the shrine cities in Iran. And then I will follow that by looking at uh, four particular case studies of how these networks develop, how particular individuals make these connections across the board. And two of the um, case studies are uh, individuals uh, in uh, the Deccan, broadly speaking, although they were not um, entirely uh, unfamiliar with what was happening further north. And uh, two of the figures are um, are more um, familiar with us from the context of Abad. Um, and in fact, they come in at the point where, although I, I did signal before colonialism in the original title, in a sense, they straddle the colonial period. So they they uh, were active in that period, which uh, which saw the beginnings of um, uh, a significant British presence and political authority in North India, uh, and then eventually even straddled the the beginnings of formal empire um, after 1856 uh, and 57 uh, in the north. So that's basically the structure of what I, I want to talk about. So the first point uh, is to begin with um, this, these terms, Persianate, Indo-Persian, Arab-Persian, Cosmopolis. Uh, now, again, uh, this, uh, this sort of feature is very much, th this uh, Focus arises out of the, the development of connected histories. I mean, one can't, um, you know, ignore the fact that a lot of this is due to the important work of individuals like Sanjay Subramanian, who famously wrote this article of his Iranians Abroad, which goes back to, I think, 1991, 92, perhaps. Uh, his work with um, Muzaffar Alam. Uh, then we've had people like Ronit Ritchie, who's written about um, the way in which connections and translations work um, across uh, from the Arabian Peninsula into uh, India and also uh, into Southeast Asia. And increasingly, the sort of debates that we're having about the Persian, uh, which are different ways in which um, uh, colleagues working on Persian, um, Persian studies as well as Persian in India are trying to engage with uh, the legacy of Marshall Hodgson's work. And then as I said, the final point, it will be about this term, um, Indo-Persian as well, and what does Indo-Persian bring to the debate, which perhaps the others don't do. But, uh, you know, I'll go through um, Persian and Indo-Persian first, and then I'll say something about the Arab or Persian cosmopolis. So, yeah, these are just some of the recent works which I think are important in that sort of debate. Um, you've got uh, Mana Kia's book. Mana, of course, was on uh, recently. Uh, you've got Richard Eaton's uh, book, which again will be familiar with a lot of people. Ruan uh, Richie's um, Islam Translated. And then these two works, which are both called The Persian at World, uh, one being Niall Green's uh, and the other one. Um, edited by Abbas Amarnat and his um, former student, Osip Ashraf, who is now at Cambridge. Um, and uh, certainly if one's interested in this whole question of what we understand by Persianet as a frame in which to locate these uh, Shi'i networks, 
um, then these are the sorts of works uh, which might be useful to consider. Um, I think one one small um, clarification is is used, and, and this is raised in in um, the Amarnat work in particular, is that sometimes people and a number of others raise this that sometimes when people talk about the concept of the Persianate, especially in India, or the the Iranis, um, there's this assumption which is broadly speaking a historical uh, that um, Irani means uh, Shi'i. Uh, it uh, means uh, association with very particular spaces um, in Iran, um, and it's juxtaposed with those who may be either uh, emphasize the Arabic or emphasize other kinds of uh, origins, either local origins or origins in Central Asia and elsewhere. So if you do not describe, describe yourself as being Persian or Irani, you are somehow by a definition Sunni, perhaps Central Asian, um, perhaps um, linking oneself to Yemen and so forth. And it's really not that simple. Um, the, the concept of Persian that uh, I am more interested in, which uh, is, is somewhat limited uh, in the way it's normally used, um, would actually embrace Yemen and Central Asia and other places as well, uh, and is not a straightforward sectarian distinction between whether one's a Sunni and whether one is, is Shi'i and the connections that one makes within the context. So first of all, the, the word Persian, as we all know, the, per, the word, um, I suspect you will have discussed this with Mana and others, so I'm not sure I need to say very much about this, but I'll, I'm just gonna say a few quick things about uh, the term Persian. As we know, it's first used by Marshall Hodgson in his famous The Venture of Islam, which I think still remains a very important historical study of um, Islamic civilization. And he's talking about this zone uh, from the Euphrates to the Oxus, um, and he describes it in, in, in terms of culture and language. Um, and so um, it's a useful way, as I mentioned, of breaking down and going beyond national historic, nationalist historiographies. Of course, the question is whether it overemphasizes Persia and, and Persian as a language itself. Uh, there's another question about whether it establishes new canons um, which replace other canons. So whether those canons are of uh, Sanskrit or vernacular languages, you know, opposed to say um, uh, the notion of the Sanskrit cosmopolis, which we'll come to in a second, um, and um, and also uh, replacing the perhaps the hegemony or the significance of Arabic. Uh, but what is important, perhaps in terms of the practices, is uh, how it is that. Um, the Persian it brings uh, to attention certain key texts which become significant across this Persian zone, right? So one talks about things about Divan Hafiz. Now, Divan Hafiz, it's very timely, um, as some of you will definitely know. Uh, it is Shabayalda. Um, in, in India, it definitely is Shabayalda because it's night, it isn't quite here yet. Um, uh, Shabayalda, of course, is the winter solstice. Uh, the actual time uh, is around 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, and as uh, we know, um, Iranian peoples of different types uh, celebrate both the spring equinox, which is Nowruz, uh, on the 21st of March, and they also celebrate um, Shabayala on the 21st of December. And for both, the Divan and Hafiz is very important. Um, so if you've ever seen the uh, the table which is set for Nowruz and Shabayalda uh, alongside the the half scene uh, you have um, the set of seven things starting with the letter scene uh, you also have a copy of the Quran and uh, usually have the Divan Hafiz and even if you do not have the Quran you definitely have the Divan Hafiz and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the way in which uh, the Divan is then used for fal for kind of um, uh, opening up the book in random, reading a ghazal uh, for a certain person, and that is supposed to tell them something meaningful about how their next year is going to go. Of course, as we know, most of the ghazals of Hafiz either are very similar in content or are similarly ambiguous, so it doesn't actually necessarily tell you something very useful. Um, but the attachment to the Divan Hafiz is, is something which is important, and it's, as I said, it's found amongst all sorts of Iranian peoples, in Iran, in Central Asia, in Afghanistan, 
Um, certainly, the Divan El Hafez remained a very important uh, work in South Asia, uh, arguably until very recently, and traveled um, uh, into um, further um, east uh, and southeast. Then you have the models of um, important works such as the Khamsa of Nezami. Uh, you had the very important ethical works of the Bustan and the Golestan of Saadi, uh, which remained um, essential texts. You had, of course, the Masnavi of, Maula, of Maulana, Maulavi. And uh, we've, uh, in recent years, uh, found out a lot about uh, texts such as Yusuf Ozalecha and the wider corpus of Jami, which, uh, despite uh, being written in Persian, uh, was widely disseminated and naturalized in lots of different contexts. So we have translations of Jami into Bengali. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, images, uh, rem remnants of Jami in Arakanese. We have Jami, of course, being translated into Chinese and so forth. So um, the, this new kind of canon of, of what I'm calling humanism, which connects the homiletic, the practical, the esoteric even, uh, becomes an important element of, of the Persianate. Now, um, Amonet uh, puts forward a, a fairly interesting idea of, um, you know, how do we begin to um, define the Persianate uh, in terms of actual intellectual practices? And he talks about four modalities, which I think are quite useful. So he talks about how in the Persian sphere, um, there are particular ways of looking at uh, statecraft, of akhlaq, uh, the akhlaq literature in particular, uh, the ideas around circles of justice and equilibrium, and the um, moral psychology of the pursuit of virtues and the foregoing of vices, and how they come together with notions of divine kingship. So sometimes what is known as the Turco-Persian um, uh, model of kingship, um, which later becomes imbued with certain um, mystical, messianic, um, sacred um, uh, notions, uh, which, uh, for example, Esfar Moin talks about in his book, The Messianic Sovereign, uh, and which is associated also with the dissemination of the Shahnameh. So the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi and how it um, is disseminated across this space. Um, everyone, uh, you know, in 1600, for example, pretty much everyone in this wider Persian zone knew that if you really wanted to give a gift to the king, the best gift you could give them is a beautiful shanane, right? And this is true of the court in Istanbul, it's true of uh, Southeast Asia, it's true of the different parts of South Asia and beyond. The second uh, point he talks about is the centrality of Sufism, of um, a certain antinomian path of blame, which is, uh, you know, Persian known as Malamat, um, and the significance of holy men in spaces, right? So this is uh, an important feature, you could say, of the civil society, uh, or the um, what is beyond uh, the court, although of course it does intersect with the court, which is, tr which is true and which is important of the Persian context. The third element he mentions is precisely some of these texts which I mentioned before, the centrality of texts like the Divan Hafez, the Khamsa Nizami, and its different um, um, imitations, of course, then the, the Haftar Rang of, of Jami, the Bostan and Golestan of Saadi, the Masnavis of uh, Maulana, of Attar, and others, and how these texts are absolutely essential to the making of um, a learned, um, a refined, a cultured individual within the sphere. And then the fourth, uh, uh, so the, this idea, I guess you would call of Adab and, and Zerofat, um, which one finds across the sphere. And the, th the four, fourth modality he talks about is common material to culture. So this is precisely the, uh, you know, things about ways of dress, of comportment of Adab, uh, the way in which um, buildings look um, and, and styles develop, um, which can be easily seen, right? I think the, the main problem perhaps with the Persianate is, as I said, it maybe overemphasizes Persian as such. Uh, and, um, you know, one has to think about how one goes beyond Persian. So it's not just a question of finding Persian terms in other languages, but, you know, what else is going on? What other kinds of cosmopolitan arrangements are available? And uh, I think quite significantly, it, it ignores and it strangely sidelines Arabic. And, and this is odd 
because when you look at the uh, learned culture in particular of the Persian sphere, it is really difficult to conceive of intellectuals who are not as conversant and um, uh, comfortable in Arabic as they are in Persian. Right? So they are very much still producing works in Arabic, they are reading works in Arabic, and they are engaging in Arabic literature and linguistics and stylistics in a, in a, se a serious way. So for example, again, coming back to Jami, one of the most influential works of Jami was Al-Fawaid of the Aliyah, which is a work on Arabic grammar that <coughs> Jami wrote for his son. And this work is arguably the most prevalent Arabic grammatical text found in the Persian zone. You know, everywhere from Istanbul through to um, to libraries in uh, in India, libraries in Southeast Asia, libraries in China. The Fawaid of the Aiyah is absolutely um, ubiquitous. And in fact, um, uh, one of the interesting things is that we don't necessarily remember this now because, again, of the way in which literary histories have been nationalized. So when people think about the literary history of Arabic, they think very much in terms of what Arabs have produced and what Arabs study now. And they don't necessarily study the Fawaid of the Aya. But for this very long period of time in this massive uh, area, it was the Fawaid of the Aya of Jami which was being studied. Now, um, so as I said, I think there are there are different ways in which we can tweak Persianate, but maybe maybe Persianate does not work. So let's think of another option. And so that's next slide. Um, oh, sorry, this is a, a picture which I cribbed off um, uh, Richard Eaton's book, um, which is a nice like picture which shows you uh, his conception of the Persianate world, and it's quite interesting the way in which Arabic and Arabian is actually um, inserted or inscribed in this. Okay, the next slide. Um, the Indo-Persian. Now, this is another important um, uh, question about whether Indo-Persian might be a better way of looking at this, especially when we're looking at the question of what the Persian means within India or within um, South Asia. Now, of course, uh, those uh, who are familiar with, uh, into, uh, with literary history will be familiar with the idea of the Sapk Hindi. So as we know, Sapke Hindi is widely used to describe what Paul Lozensky has called uh, the Mughal Safavid Ghazal uh, and poetics in that Mughal Safavid period. Um, and uh, when nationalist literary histories were being written in the 19th and 20th century, um, they divided the history of Persian literature and styles into different sabks, sabks um, and uh, Sabki Hindi, to a large extent, was derided and um, uh, really um, considered to be inferior, um, partly because it was mainly produced in India, uh, but also, um, which actually, strictly speaking, is not necessarily true, um, but also because it stylistically seemed to be a bit clumsy. Um, it used uh, long uh, meters as opposed to short meters, and the idea was that good poetry should be in short meters. So, for example, the Masnavi <coughs> of Rumi and other works and Attar tend to be in shorter meters. When one thinks of the long meters of Sapki Hindi, one thinks of um, poets such as um, Mirza Bedil, um, uh, Saib Tabrizi, and so forth. Um, and um, uh, they also were. Um, they thought that the way in which um, heavy sort of metaphysical themes were dealt with in Sapki Hindi was very um, obscure, it was difficult. It didn't mean that, uh, you know, poets such as uh, Maulana and Attar and Sanai and Nizami did not en en engage in metaphysics or even in mystical thought, uh, and certainly Jami. Um, but rather that the way in which Sapki Hindi dealt with it was um, somewhat clumsy. Um, and so then from that you get the sense of, well, is Sapki Hindi kind of a way of life which is complicated, right? So it's a way of looking at literature and intellectual production and transmission which is um, excessively uh, complicated, um, is uh, likes to multiply um, 
uh, entities and devices and styles beyond what is necessary. Uh, so that Sabke Hindi can then uh, be applied not just to poetry, but to all sorts of writings and intellectual productions in this time, even maybe ones which are produced in Arabic. And that's, I think, an interesting question when we start looking at some of the important Arabic works in the 18th century. Uh, one thinks, for example, of the work of Azad Bilgrami uh, and others, and whether there is that kind of um, stylistic element within it. And it also raises the question of what is Indian about the Persianate? You know, how, in, in what sense does one find within this frame of the Indo-Persian the coming together of, um, you know, what is sometimes called the Persian and the Sanskrit cosmopolis? Now, of course, uh, cosmopolis has been used by Sheldon Pollock for the Sanskrit cos cosmopolis to mean, you know, not just literally the space of uh, Sanskrit uh, production within South Asia, but also the significance of motifs and ideas and symbols from that production, which go far beyond um, both usages in Sanskrit, uh, far beyond South Asia, and also into other kinds of languages. Um, so one thinks of, for example, um, somewhere like Siam, as it used to be called, and certainly Thailand as it is now, uh, very much being part of what one might describe as the Sanskrit cosmopolis, as well as uh, pretty much most of the uh, archipelago of Southeast Asia. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, certain other things one can think about is what's particular about the Indian aspect of in Indo-Persian is the way in which the humanities and self-fashioning and the way in which world-making is, is engaged, the sorts of texts that one sees, the travelogues that one sees, um, as well as the beginnings of uh, the serious engagement with the language. So, you know, for example, someone like Sirajuddin Khan Arzu in the 18th century is a very important figure. Um, there is um, um, Arthur Dudney's work on, on uh, Khan Arzu. There is um, Prashant Keshav Murthy's work as well. Uh, Khan Arzu is a very important person, apart from the fact that um, you know, he was interested in the relationship between different languages. So Siraj al Lorat is very much a work interested in the relationship between Persian and Sanskrit. But he was also very much defending the way in which Persian usage in India is quite significant and sometimes even normative against its um, Iranian detractors. So, you know, one's familiar with this um, argument within Persian between um, uh, Hazin al Lahiji, who of course famously left um, Iran after the um, Afghan sack of Isfahan, eventually ends up in Banaras um, much later, uh, and who is, um, uh, to put it uh, bluntly, rather um, dismissive of uh, Indians, Indian culture, and especially Indian usage of Persian, and the way in which uh, Khan al uh, defends Indo Persian and actually goes on the attack. Um, and then one sees this. Um, debate about uh, Persian and who, in a sense, owns Persian or who has a right to speak about Persian being played out in the Tazkere literature in the 18th and the 19th century, um, resulting from this. Um, and also you have the very important works of uh, Azad Bilgami, who I've already mentioned, uh, not just his kind of Arabic praise of, of Hindustan, Subhat al-Marjan fi Athar Hindustan, which is still a relatively understudied work. There are a number of editions of this text now. There's at least one Oligar edition, and there are two editions produced in Iraq. Um, and there, I'm sure there are plenty more. And these are um, not to include the lithographs. I've got a picture of the lithograph here. Um, and his Ghazlan al-Hind, which is about the, the poets of India who were engaged in Arabic and also in, in, in Persian. So the way in which, um, you know, uh, those who were very much in India uh, thought that they had as much right and uh, and authority and control over uh, and even a certain normative understanding of the language um, in comparison to those who um, may have come from uh, places where they claimed to be much more native um, speakers of the language. So there are, there are different uh, elements in how Indo-Persian might indicate the ways in which what is more specifically Indian about the usages of Persian, a certain literary style, 
uh, which might be uh, more um, uh, more particular and more useful uh, with respect to Persian, uh, uh, with in comparison to Persian. But what I really want to suggest as as the useful frame for these Shi networks is a different concept, and this is the next slide. Um, uh, and this is this idea of the Arab Persian cosmopolis. Now, as I said, I'm, I'm very much drawing upon Ronit Ritchie's work as well as some other recent ish work on Arabic in India. So one thinks of Tahir Qutbuddin's um, you know, important article, which is around 20 years ago now, I think. And recently, there are two um, uh, doctoral dissertations at SOAS, there's Simon Lee's work, there's Christopher Ball's work, Christopher's now at the Dari show how it is that Arabic always works alongside Persian. Um, that uh, the scholarly language of the learned remained Arabic, that it was in, it was often inflected in the Persian, um, and that Arabic produced a certain kind of republic of letters in which Arabic grammar, Arabic inscribed disciplines remained important and were links uh, within South Asia, but also Ijazas, which are these licenses for study and of transmission of texts between scholars, you know, continue to be written in Arabic. Of course, you know, so, and this is not just, you know, um, licenses for the study of hadith or for more scriptural texts, but even, you know, sometimes for literature, uh, sometimes for the study of philosophy, for the occult, um, for theology, uh, for mystical texts and so forth. And uh, especially in uh, the 17th and 18th century, you can actually see a way in which Arabic is increasingly being um, reinforced within this this, this uh, context, and the Indians are increasingly uh, playing an important role in inscribing Arabic. Um, so uh, we'll come back to the case of Sayyid Ali Khan, who is one of my key case studies, um, who wrote most of his corpus of works in Arabic. He wrote a very important commentary on, um, he wrote two important commentaries on Arabic grammatical texts. One is on a grammar of written by Sheikh Baha'i in uh, the Iranian Sheikh al-Islam, or not Iranian actually, the Amili, so from Jabal Amel, modern Lebanon, um, jurist who ends up in, in, in Iran and becomes the Sheikh al-Islam of Isfahan, as well as the text which I've already mentioned, which is Al-Fawahid, the Diyaiya of Ajami. As well as, uh, you know, two very important uh, figures of the 18th century, again, rather understudied one being, of course, said, Ghulam Ali Azad bil um, and the second one being uh, Sayyid Murtaza Zabidi. Um, you know, Murtaza Zabidi's uh, Arabic lexicon, Taj al Arus, is used by pretty much everyone. Um, most people who have engaged with his work, or for example, have, have read his very famous commentary on Ghazali's Ihya al uh, probably do not. Uh, realized that he was someone who came from Bilgram, who came from these uh, Sayyids who had, um, uh, you know, claimed a descent from Wasit in Iraq and had come and settled in uh, eventually in Bilgram. I had been there for a number of uh, centuries at that point, um, but still retained a sense that they were part of this wider kind of Arabic sphere. So I think for these sorts of reasons, um, it, I know it sounds a bit clumsy, Arabo-Persian cosmopolis, but it gives you a sense of which there is um, this wider uh, cosmopolitan space. And by cosmopolitan, I mean deliberately the, the idea of um, connectivity, of um, uh, being able to travel, having uh, skills which you can transfer from one space to another in search of, of patronage. Um, and uh, you know, a space where, which is beyond perhaps the, the narrow confines of where Arabic was, uh, uh, was originally studied or Persian was originally studied and, and being transmitted. So it goes far beyond that. Um, it allows for um, individuals training in Arabic and Persian to make, to allow them to connect to others. And it then became part of the multilingual world in which people lived. I think this multilingualism is very important. Uh, one of the features, there are a number of kind of negative features of modernity that one can talk about, and one of them is the ways in which we are um, extremely uh, nowadays monolingual. And 
uh, one of the features of that is that we are increasingly monolingual in English. Um, and uh, certainly with respect to these sorts of um, debates and uh, literary productions uh, within the Arab or Persian cosmopolis, English doesn't even begin to describe and render uh, what the possibilities are there. It doesn't uh, under necessarily appreciate the ways in which uh, the Arab or Persian cosmopolis uh, interacted with, uh, for example, um, Marathi or Bengali or Deccani or um, Telugu and other languages and other literary uh, practices which perhaps came out of the Sanskrit um, uh, uh, cosmopolis but then interacted and became um, uh, interpenetrated with the Arab or Persian cosmopolis. So that's really the frame. Now I realize that that's a ridiculously long tamhid, so I should really start to get into the question of, of Shiism because I haven't really mentioned that much. So let's move on um, to the question of uh, what is uh, Shi in South Asia. Uh, so the next slide. Yes, so uh, just a, a few sort of general points which I want to make about Shi Islam and the Arab Persian cosmopolis and then we'll uh, say a few things uh, related to that on uh, the Deccan and uh, the, sh the shrine city. So obviously we have this a wider theme of devotion and love for the family of the prophet of shrines and, and pilgrimage to those centers, but also their, um, their um, uh, replication within South Asia, the role of descendants of the Prophet Sayyids as kind of mediating holy figures. We have uh, the dissemination of the learned culture of, of, um, of Shi Islam, so not just the key Arabic texts, the original texts um, being uh, disseminated within uh, India, uh, but also the process of vernacularization. So how some of the key works were then translated into Persian. Now, uh, what's really interesting, again, if you just look at simple things like the the, um, the manuscript traditions that we have in South Asia, um, in the big libraries in the north and also the libraries in places like Madras um, and especially Hyderabad, um, is that there are certain kinds of texts which one finds in abundance in India, which you do not even find in other places. Um, one very simple example of a text which um, has survived in eight manuscripts um, is what's known as the Tafsir of Imam Jafar Sadiq. Uh, now, this is a text for which the earliest manuscript we have is the 15th century manuscript. Of the eight manuscripts which survive, seven survive in India. And not only do they survive in India, but it seems as if most of them were also copied in India. Um, so that tells you something about the interest and about the, the idea of preserving tradition with respect to Shi Islam, which was uh, present um, in South Asia, um, which is quite significant. And, you know, this is not to kind of go into this debate about whether this a famous Quranic commentary actually goes back to the time of Imam Jafar Sadiq, so you know, very early on um, in the 8th century, but rather to show that this was a, considered to be an important text, and also the contents are very much um, consistent with what uh, one sees of classical uh, Shi'i Quranic commentary. So if you compare it to the other famous commentaries of the, the 10th and the 11th century, there is a, a large overlap in the, in the material. And then, of course, you have the Arab Persian poetry of praise and mourning, which is quite important, and their inflections in different kinds of um, Indian vernaculars and so forth. Now, uh, so moving on to the uh, two, other, two further features of uh, Shi Islam in the Arab Persian cosmopolis. So, this is the next slide. Um, uh, we'll skip this. Go next slide. Uh, so, uh, again, what I want to stress, and this is significant, is the importance of the Deccan. Um, the Deccan is really where you have a significant um, early encounters of, um, of uh, Shi Islam and the intellectual production. Now, I, I haven't mentioned, of course, uh, Multan and the Ismailis in the Punjab and Sindh, which is much, much earlier. Um, and that will kind of take me way beyond, um, you know, 
if one was going to do a full historical survey of how this develops, it's just not possible in this short period. I'm already trying to cover far too much. Um, but there are um, some studies of that and how, in fact, the um, uh, what we see from that period in Multan and in southern, uh, in southern Punjab and Sin um, it still has uh, an important role in understanding the nature of culture, of she or she inflected culture, even well into the modern period, and the way in which, um, uh, for example, the role of descendants of the prophets of Sayyids, of shrines, of the ways in which uh, Sufi practices, uh, Shi'i Sufi practices, are then intersected with uh, types of um, uh, kind of antinomian practice, like amongst Qalandas, as well as uh, connecting with different kinds of Indic devotional uh, practices in Pakta, in forms of yoga, um, in um, uh, also in uh, uh, some uh, devotional aspects of Vaishnavism and so forth. And um, I'm sure this has come up in, in your other talks, and there will be more talks, I'm sure, which deal with this, uh, in, the, in how it is that, particularly within um, a Sufi milieu, um, you have these very important interactions with Indic uh, themes and ideas. Um, and it's, it's certainly an important element of um, this very significant recent work by Shankar Nair, uh, Translating Wisdom, uh, which does that particularly with respect to the Mughal period. So uh, the Deccan, uh, the earliest uh, uh, kind of interactions one has is in the, the Bahmanid period. So this was the important, um, I guess, um, uh, sultanate which arose um, out of the Tughlaqs. Um, they had a very important relationship to Shiraz. Um, uh, you've got uh, the influx of Persians coming in uh, as part of the um, intellectual um, elite at court. Um, you have the um, uh, figures such as Fazullah Inju. You've got the um, beginnings of links with uh, the study of philosophy in places like Shiraz, the Maqulat coming in. You have the holy men, the Ne'matullahis in Bidar. Um, uh, you know, at this point in the early period, uh, the Ne'matullahi order would not necessarily have been Shi, but they're gradually becoming uh, a Shi order. And of course, you have the patronage of rulers and giving gifts to Karbala and to Najaf, to the, sh the important shrines in, in Iraq. So you've got Ahmad Shah's um, bequests, um, which, you know, are... Uh, 300 years before the very famous other bequests that everyone knows about uh, from the uh, 19th century. Uh, you have the important uh, successor states uh, in which are, are she inflected and, and officially she. So you've got Bijapur, Bijapur, which officially declares itself as a she state um, within two years of the Safavids. They have a very close relationship with the, uh, the Safavid state. Um, uh, so uh, in the early 1500s, you have then two official polities uh, in the Persian at world or in the Arab Persian cosmopolis, which are officially Shi'i, one being the Safavids and the second one being the other Shahis in Bijapur. Uh, and you have a number of very significant intellectuals who are mediating between the Safavid sphere and the Deccan, as well as connecting with different um, uh, Deccan Sultanates. So you have Sayyid Ahmad Hiravi, and you have this very important figure, Shah Tahir Deccani. Um, now, Shah Tahir uh, comes from uh, the lineage, well, he is of the lineage of the Ismaili Imams. Um, uh, he is sometimes claimed as being a rival to the Imamate. Um, so he had very important links in the Safavid state because the, what we know about the the Ismaili Imams in that period from um, Anjadan uh, near Mahallat is that uh, they were um, like the Nemotullahis um, uh, in uh, Bijapur. Uh, the Ismaili Imams uh, presented themselves kind of as Sufis and were uh, were linked to the Safavid state. There was a lot of intermarriage with the Safavid elites. Um, and Shah Tahir, of course, becomes uh, an important um, intermediary uh, between the Safavid state and the different um, sultanates in the Deccan, the Nizam Shahis, the other Shahis, uh, and, and others. Um, we have, of course, um, his designation as an ambassador. And, of course, he's also one of the most significant um, early figures who is teaching uh, 
uh, what by this point is considered to be the dominant Shi theological texts um, of Arabic uh, in the Deccan. So he's teaching the texts of Nasir bin Tusi and um, Alame Hilli, um, and he's basically disseminating, uh, interestingly, disseminating 12 Shi ideas and texts, despite the fact that he himself is an Ismaili Imam or claim it to the Ismaili Imam. Um, again, there's much more that could be said about Shah Sh Tahir, um, but uh, we should uh, skip. Um, and then you have conceptions of Shia universal and not, not skip yet. Um, you have the Qutb Shahis and Hyderabad, which of course is perhaps the best known example, um, the foundation of Hyderabad, the patronage, the poetry of the Qutb Shahs themselves, and the, the massive um, translation movement. I mean, this is one of the big translation movements which is happening in this period. A lot of people know about the um, uh, the Perso Indica project, you know, Sanskrit into Persian in the Mughal period. What um, people don't necessarily know about is that the important role the Qutb Shahis had in translating Arabic texts into Persian, um, particularly for a Shi intellectual context. And the Qutb Shahis were very important. In many cases, they were translating texts even before they were being translated in Iran. Um, and this is true of a number of the very significant collections of hadith and so forth. And then moving on to the next uh, slide. Um, so yes, so we have these famous Gilanis and Astarabadis in the Deccan, uh, of which there are many. I mean, they could have been part of the, the mix of uh, my case studies. You have Hakim Ali Gilani, you have Mir Mormon Astarabadi, you've got Ibn Khatun Um, And they show the way in which uh, Shi intellectuals in this period, even though they are based predominantly in the Deccan, are very much linked with these other important spaces, Jabal Amal, uh, modern day uh, Lebanon, um, Iran, uh, Mir Mormon Astarabadi comes from Astarabad, he's related, he's a nephew of Mir Fakhridin Samaki. San Marki is a Sheikh al Islam of Mashhad, um, he's a very important philosopher theologian himself. He's also a kinsman of uh, Mir Abul Qasim Fendereski and Mir Damad. Mir Damad is um, a very significant figure in Iran, and also uh, his works then are disseminated into uh, North India much later. Um, Mir Abul Qasim Fendereski, of course, uh, we know about his interest in the in the yoga tradition. So, you know, his Muntakhab uh, Jog Vashisht. Uh, uh, is a well-known text and his interest generally in Indic practices, his many trips to India, uh, his um, um, uh, audiences with Shah Jahan, etc., which which we all know about. Um, so Mir Momin is a, a really important figure. Ibn Khatun Lami is also a very important figure, not just because of their translations and their dissemination of, of the intellectual production of Shiism um, in the period, but also because they were politically extremely significant figures at court. So Mir Momin was the Peshwa. Um, uh, Ibn Khatun um, succeeded him in a sense uh, a bit later as well. Uh, so these are very significant court figures um, who represent that kind of um, fluidity of, of how connections work in the Arab Persian cosmopolis. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll skip this. We'll come back. I mean, I, I've written about this, of course. Uh, Nadeem Saab has also written about um, the Qazi Nullah Shustri. Of course, his, his late father um, wrote a very important work on uh, Qazi Nullah Shustri. But I will, I will skip this because that would have to be a completely different paper. And there's quite a lot to say about that. The importance of the shrine cities. Now, as I said, these, these connections were already there very early on. So you've got, um, as I said, uh, Ahmad Shah Bahmani, uh, giving gifts to the shrine cities in Kerbala and Najaf. Their significance was uh, that there were, of course, uh, places of pilgrimage, of patronage, of giving of gifts and endowments, but also there were places of study. So people would go and study, there would establish links, there would be um, correspondence going back and forth, there were devotional spaces. And, you know, then later on, as I mentioned earlier, you had the replication of these um, shrines within the um, the South Asian context, um, you know, the most famous example, of course, being the replication of all of the shrines um, in um, uh, in Lucknow, 
uh, in the towards the end of the Navabi period. Um, and there was also uh, alongside the pilgrimage, there was the, the burial traffic. Um, so you know, people would would be buried um, in um, in uh, in the shrine cities, in the the graveyards. There, um, there were different kinds of gifts which were being made. Um, one of the reasons why we have some not just artifacts but also manuscripts which are importantly produced in India, then ending up in places like Karbala and Mashhad is because they were given as gifts um, to the shrines. Um, so given as gifts, not stolen from India. Um, that's a different case altogether, which we also know about um, more recently um, uh, happening where um, libraries in North India in particular have been looted um, and sold off uh, in, in many different ways. So the, the link with the shrine cities was extremely important. Um, it was this kind of, uh, uh, you know, as I said, about uh, the intellectual networks. It was about pilgrimage. It was about devotion. And it was about these exchanges of patronage um, and uh, uh, of, of uh, commercial um, transactions as well. Now, uh, moving on, uh, I hope I've kind of set the scene sufficiently, right, to go to our case study. So we've said enough about what I understand by the Arab or Persian cosmopolis, said enough about the features of, of Shia Islam and intellectual traditions within uh, South Asia. And now looking at uh, the four examples of um, uh, figures who were extremely significant in this kind of exchange. So the first one I have is Sayyid Ali Khan Madani, uh, Sayyid Ali Khan Shirazi Dashtaki. And he was a figure who was, in a sense, circulating between Shiraz, Medina, Hyderabad, Isfahan. I could also add to that Yemen, uh, Mocha, Aden, um, sorry, Mocha in particular, and um, uh, ports in um, Burhanpur at some point. Uh, he's in Burhanpur and other places as well. Uh, he comes from a very form, uh, prominent Dashtaki Sayyid family of Shiraz. Um, uh, so their network includes people like Mir Fatullah Shirazi. Fatullah Shirazi, of course, um, moved to the Deccan and then later ended up in the court of Akbar. He is, uh, you know, uh, uh, credited with popularizing the study of philosophy, Islamic philosophy in the north. Um, they had this very prominent um, uh, curriculum model which came out of the Madrasa Mansuriya, which is established in Shiraz in the late 15th century. And this was a way in which the study of philosophy and the intellectual sciences was balanced with the study of scripture. And the descendants of the family were significant in Hyderabad, in Shiraz, in uh, Medina. Uh, there are descendants of the family in Iraq, uh, in Lebanon as well nowadays. Um, and one of the important um, studies of the family is by the descendant uh, in the, who died in 1892, if I remember correctly, Mirza Hassan Fasai. He wrote the Fars Nama in Nasiri, which is kind of a gazette of Fars, which is the province in which Shiraz is found. But it also has a very important study of the family and the links that the family had beyond. Uh, we also know that other uh, figures in the family were linked to the Qutb Shahis and the Safavids. Um, they were also linked in the mediation of establishing marriage links between the Qutb Shahis and the Safavids. So these are, you know, significant, significant individuals. Now, Sayyid Ali Khan himself, uh, and as you can tell from that title, Sayyid Ali Khan, this is a title that he's given in Hyderabad, um, was born in Medina, uh, and he's a very significant cosmopolitan figure. So on his mother's side, his uh, grandfather was uh, Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Manufi, who is a Syrian Shafi'i. Um, he was a Syrian Shafi'i Mufti of, um, of Mecca, right? Um, and uh, of course, his father's side are these Dashtakis um, who have been going back and forth from Medina, Hyderabad. The, these two generations already linked to Hyderabad and certainly Shiraz. He becomes important in the study of Arabic literature. He writes a very famous um, work, the Sulaf al-Asr, on poets uh, in the period. Um, and he's mentioned in a lot of the uh, compendia on Arabic literature and on Arabic literary figures. Um, his own study of Arabic literature and particularly hadith, which comes out of uh, Mecca and Medina, connects him to individuals, not just his grandfather, who's a Syrian Shafi, um, so to other teachers who are from Syria, to those who are from Yemen. So he has relations um, 
for example, through the the, the um, welcome back to that in a second uh, with the um, the Zaydi um, imams in the north of Yemen, but also with the the Ba'al Alawi Aydarus um, scholars who are in the Hadramaut. Uh, he has teachers who are from Bahrain as well. Um, and um, the other important link, which is a local one for him, is that the, the ruling um, uh, family who controlled Mecca and Medina in his time were known as the Banul Hassan, so they were descendants of Hassan, uh, the grandson of the Prophet. Um, and because of that link, there's a, a sense in which a, a lot of um, Sayyid Ali Khan's uh, network is also based on the fact that they are all descendants of the Prophet and they recognize themselves as kinsmen, regardless of whether they are Persian speakers or Arabic speakers or others. Um, that kinship is important, which links people from Syria to Yemen, to the Hejaz, Bahrain, um, to um, uh, Southeast, to what is now Indonesia, um, uh, the Malay uh, world, um, West India, um, and the Deccan. Now, uh, as, a, as a young man, he moves uh, with his father, Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmed, to Hyderabad. Um, and uh, he spends some time uh, in Hyderabad. When you have a change in the Qutb Shahis, um, his father is imprisoned. He is uh, out of favor. He finds favor for a short period in Burhanpur. And he keeps on going back and forth. He goes back to Medina and Mecca. He goes to Sh back to Shiraz and he studies and then teaches in Isfahan for a short period. And his students in Isfahan include uh, the Khatun Abadi family. So the Khatun Abadi family of scholars are related to uh, Majlisi, uh, Alame Majlisi, who is arguably the most significant, politically uh, significant um, scholar at the end of the 17th century in, in Safed Isfahan. Um, and also Hazin Elaji. So Hazin, who is the famous poet and literary figure who ends up in India, is also a student of uh, Sayyid Ali Khan uh, from his time in Isfahan. And he writes a number of, of works which then connect these networks and, uh, but also reinscribe why Arabic is important in this. So he has this very famous travelogue called Salwat al Gharib, which is account of growing up in Medina, his, his travels in India, his travels in Yemen, um, his, his um, connections with people in Syria and uh, of course in Iran. And he's not the only one. There are a number of other figures. Um, Marco Salati, for example, has written at least two or three books on figures from the 17th century who um, live between the Deccan, Yemen, uh, the Hejaz, um, Iran, and Syria. Uh, so yeah, some people like say the Basil Amali and others. And they are, they are figures who uh, are equally um, comfortable writing poetry in Arabic and Persian and sometimes in other languages. Um, and they connect uh, up these, um, these figures, these, these points of uh, learning uh, across these places. So, um, so Sayyid Ali Khan is one very important figure. And, and for many people, he remains a very significant figure because he wrote perhaps the most popular commentary on a Sahifa Sajadiya, which is this collection of, of uh, prayers, of supplications, um, uh, associated with the fourth uh, Shia Imam Ali Zain al uh, and it remains the most uh, uh, prominent um, commentary on that. Now, the next uh, case study, which is the next slide, uh, is Nizamuddin Gilani. Uh, now, I will say that a lot of what I'm saying about Nizamuddin Gilani comes from this excellent recent Duke PhD by Hunter Bandy. It's a wonderful work, and I really hope that Hunter publishes it soon. It's um, a very serious study of Shiism, uh, natural philosophy, and um, I guess what I am talking about, the Arab-Persian cosmopolis uh, within the Deccan. So he is uh, a figure who is important in the study of medicine and natural philosophy, and of course, in the study of philosophy itself. He uh, grew up in Gilan, which in that period, at that time, although it's part of the Safavid Empire, it's not entirely um, um, incorporated, so it's it's fairly kind of autonomous. He studied in Shiraz and Isfahan. Um, he uh, goes and studies and has pilgrimages in Iraq and the Hejaz and Mecca and Medina. He moves to originally to the Mughal realms in 1630 and becomes attached to Mahabad Khan. Um, 
Later in 1634, he moves to Hyderabad uh, and he dies in uh, Hyderabad in 1662. Uh, and when he is in Hyderabad, he uh, becomes an important person at court. He also becomes a Qutub Shahi ambassador. And in that um, uh, office, he uh, visits uh, the Ottoman controlled shrine cities in Iraq. Um, now, there is a very interesting text, and this text is on the left, the two pictures of manuscripts, the top one, is his account of his teachers and significant intellectual figures that he knew. So he mentions Mir Damad and Sheikh Bahai and Mir Fendereski and Khalifa Sultan and Sayyid Abdullah Shushtari in Isfahan, all very significant figures of that period. Um, we've already mentioned Mir Damad, Sheikh Bahai, Mir Fendereski. Khalifa Sultan was the vizier on, under um, uh, Shah Sul Safi and also under um, Shah Abbas II. Uh, then also he knows and meets uh, Muhammad Masum Dashtaki, who of course is Sayyid Ali Khan's grandfather, um, and uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Amin Asrabadi, who is a famous Akhbari figure in Mecca. In Shiraz, he comes across Shah Taqiyuddin Nasaba, Sayyid Nizamuddin Dashtaki. This, of course, is um, uh, not the, uh, the father of Sayyid Ali Khan, but kind of a distant uncle of his. Uh, in Shiraz. Shah Taqiyuddin Nasaba is very important because apart from the fact that he's a genealogist and for Sayyid networks, that's an important thing. Uh, he's also uh, the key figure uh, in the early part of the 17th, uh, 17th century alongside Nizami Dashtaki is actually teaching philosophy in Shiraz. Uh, and then of course, Hakim Ali Gilani and Sayyid Nurullah Shushtari in Agra. Uh, the other thing which he does is he uh, writes this massive commentary on the Nahj al which has never been published. Um, there are a few manuscripts which re remain. It's quite a unique and very serious piece of work, which is written in Arabic and in Persian. It may have been completed in Isfahan, but what we do have is that the manuscripts which have survived were all copied in Hyderabad. Um, so they tell you something about the local significance and dissemination. Um, uh, some of the best manuscripts have now ended up in India, but there are still manuscripts in, in uh, sorry, in Iran, but there are still manuscripts in India. So Nizamuddin Gilani is another figure who tells us a lot about this kind of exchange within this wider world in the 17th century. So these are the two case studies from the Deccan. So let's move on to the case studies in the north. So we have um, someone who I've written an article on, say that Dildar Ali, Nasir Abadi, and then the family that he kind of, of scholars that he spawns, um, who are known as the Khandan Ijtihad. Um, so Sayyid Dala Ali um, was, uh, you know, a figure attached to um, Hassan Raza Khan, who is um, Asif al wazir. Um, he was then um, sent to study in the shrine cities by Hassan Raza Khan. Uh, where he studies with a number of significant figures, Sayyid Mahdi Bahal Ulum, Baqir Behbahani, Mahdi Sharastani. The reason why these figures are important is because in the second half of the 18th century, there's a real kind of intellectual struggle going on in the shrine cities between what then become known as Akhbaris and Usulis, right? So Akhbaris are those who very much insist that to have reached certainty in knowledge, one has to have texts which go back to the Imams themselves. Um, Usulis are uh, more open to the possibility of deriving law based on probability and much more open to the use of reason to come up with uh, uh, new understandings of theology and the law. Uh, when he returns, he becomes then um, uh, a defender of the Usuli uh, and anti khbari position. He establishes the first Friday prayers in the north in the year 1200, 1786. And then he establishes a, a center for learning for the Shia in Deccan, uh, which gradually becomes what is the Madrasa Sultania under his son, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Sultan al Ulama. Uh, now, Sayyid al Ali was quite a fractious individual as well, uh, which we can see there's different kinds of debates he has. He, had, he has debates with the Farangi Mahallis, who, um, you know, those who were, came up with the Darse Nizami um, curriculum, the Maqulat. Um, uh, so he, he engaged with them. He wrote this work called Imad al-Islam, which is the defense of Shi theology um, against the authorities of uh, Farangi Mahal. He wrote an anti-Akhbari work, Asas al-Usul. He wrote anti-Sufi works. Uh, 
there was an important um, this kind of uh, struggle of authority at the other court between Jishti Sufis, people like Shah Ali Akbar Maududi, and uh, figures such as Sayyid al Ali, um, and this is in the Shahab al Thaqib, he also wrote a Persian version of that text. And uh, his own uh, sermons, which started in 1786, were then put together as Fawaid al Asafiyya uh, for the new um, Friday Mosque, the Asafi, um, which was really uh, about how this dissemination of this new Shia theology in this. Um, uh, in this polity could work in this Abadi Nawabi. Um, and in many ways, what it shows is uh, the attempt at introducing uh, the practices, the rational practices of the shrine cities in Iraq into to North India and really establishing. And so um, in some ways, one of these you know, consistent struggles amongst Shi scholarly elites in across South Asia, but especially across the north, across Hindustan, since the uh, 19th century, has been very much between those, uh, you know, who consider the authority of the shrine cities to be paramount, and those who are far more interested in the way in which local uh, practices, authority, uh, veneration, patronage works. And sometimes this plays out as a Sufi versus anti-Sufi uh, debate or Sufis versus Mullahs, if you want to call it that, um, particularly in places like the Punjab, uh, but also in parts of, of UP. Um, but it also sometimes plays it out in theological terms in what's known as the Sheikhi debate. Now, I don't want to go into that, but it's it's really, you know, about how one sees the the role of the, the imam and how one accesses it, whether one needs to go through authorities in the shrine cities or whether one has a more direct um, um, access. My last case study, um, and I realize I've been talking for far too long. Um, yeah, these are, I, I just want to show you two examples of ways in which these connections between um, the Khandan Ishtihad and the shrine cities work. So this, for example, is uh, an, a case of an ijaza, the, uh, from Sayyid Ali Tabatabai to Sayyid Ali. Sayyid Ali Tabatabai was probably the most prominent jurist in uh, Najaf um, in, the, um, uh, in the later part of the 18th century. And then with the next uh, slide, uh, this is an example of uh, one of Sayyid Ali, uh, Sayyid Ali's most uh, significant sons, um, Sayyid Hussain, known as Sayyid Al-Ulama. And the correspondence that he has uh, with uh, Wahida Behbahani, who is the famous uh, Usuli figure who really kind of destroys the Akhbaris in Karbala, and Sayyid Ibrahim Qazwini, who is one of the first um, significant people to come up with a theory of legal, uh, a legal theory which uh, establishes the authority of um, the Usuli trend um, within the shrine cities. Uh, these are letters in Persian. Um, one of the interesting things in recent years is that there is this um, um, uh, Shia Shanasi in Qom, which is increasingly turning its attention to works which are being produced in India. And so they have, uh, for example, edited the correspondence of the Khandan Ishtihad. They've edited a lot of these um, works, um, uh, for example, Awlaq al Dhahab, which is. Um, Mufti Muhammad Abbas, um, uh, Shushtari's account of uh, Sultan Ulama. They have um, uh, published uh, Aynai uh, Haq uh, um, Nama, which is a, a study of Sayyid Ali and others. And with, within those editions, they have um, also edited a lot of the correspondence, both in Arabic and Persian, which gives you a real sense of the connections that these figures had going into the shrine cities and also going into Iran. Now, the final um, case study is uh, the Mosavik in Tories. Now, um, uh, again, very famous figures, uh, Nishapuri, um, descends to the Prophet who uh, settled in Kintur in Barabanki in the 14th century. Um, uh, there are a number of figures who are important in the family. There's Mir Muhammad Quli, um, uh, who died in 1844, who acted as a judge for the British at Meerut um, and eventually becoming Sadr al-Sadur. Uh, he's related to the Shushtari al-Jazaris. Um, so I mentioned Mufti Muhammad Abbas, um, uh, 
in Avad just now. Uh, he also had scholarly links within the Sirabadis. I have a, an example of this in the next slide. Um, and he also wrote uh, some, yeah, so this is the, the famous correspondence between uh, uh, the Mufti um, Muhammad Quli, Abba, uh, Muhammad, uh, Quli and um, Sayyid al-Ulama, uh, the son of the Ali, uh, who I mentioned uh, before. So if you just go with, back to the previous slide, uh, the pre yeah, that's a thank you. So, and he has a number of important sons. The the, the one who's pro perhaps best known is Sayyid Hamid Hussain, who wrote this work, this very important polemic, um, Abaqat al Anwar. Um, and uh, it was then his son, uh, Sayyid Nasir Hussain, who established the, the famous Nasiriya Library in Lucknow. Uh, another son, Sayyid Siraj Hussain, acted as a, uh, also as a British judge. He's one of the first individuals to embrace English learning translate works into Persian Urdu. Uh, his own son, Sayyid Karam Hussain, then later became a professor at Aligarh. Um, and so this is, a, I guess you could say, a different kind of cosmopolitanism, which is starting to bring English learning into the, the mix as well. Um, and in fact, uh, I think it's very difficult to understand elements of Shi modernism, in, especially in, in North India or even in, in the Deccan, without the way in which English and English learning then becomes part of this Arabo-Persian cosmopolis. Um, and then the third figure, the third son is Sayyid Ijaz Hussain, who is very important in terms of biographies and um, bibliographies. So his Kashf al al Astar, which he wrote on the books of the Shi tradition, which are available in India, actually tells us quite a lot. Um, it predates um, uh, other bibliographies for by quite a long time. So, uh, you know, nowadays most people use Adariya of Arab Azog Tehrani, but Kashf al Hujab al Astai remains a very important source for what the Shia tradition was, not just in India, but also across this Arab Persian cosmopolis. Uh, he also wrote Shudur Iyan, Shudur Iyan fi Tarajim al Iyan, which is on biographies, which tells us a bit more about the networks seen from India. Of course, there's many other sources which do this. I mean, I'm taking four cases, but if you look at texts, we we have so many texts, particularly from this period, the 18th and 19th century, which actually show how uh, the scholarship which is coming out of people based in India or Indians studying in the shrine cities is absolutely essential for the understanding of the Shia tradition. So for example, later we have um, uh, Muhammad Ali Kashmiri and his Nujum of Sama, which is a very important uh, compendium of biographies of scholars in the 19th century, which includes a number of, of, of cases of those who were in, in India. Uh, you have um, uh, different continuations of, of Amal al Amil, 17th century. You have continuations of Sayyid Ali Khan's Ad Darajat al Rafi'a um, in the 19th and 20th century which again, uh, you know, place um, uh, the Indian um, uh, Shi um, scholarly elite within this wider kind of network of, of, of people in different places. So just to come to some uh, concluding remarks. Um, so if you skip, yeah, that's it, yeah. So, you know, texts and context are important. Um, within this uh, Arabo-Persian cosmopolis and the Shi context, the curricula, the way in which Ma'pulat the rational sciences relate to the manhulat, the six scriptural sciences, the processes of vernacularization of texts, the way in which political um, theology is understood, patronage, polities, and the sorts of sources that we have which help us understand these links, um, especially the correspondence works we have um, and the ijazat, which tell us about the way in which individuals and texts traveled. Uh, the next slide. And so, you know, what I want to show is that if we want to uh, understand kind of con connected Shi intellectual histories uh, within this wider Arab or Persian cosmopolis, um, then, um, you know, the, the place of South Asia, of, uh, of others of the North and also of the Deccan is extremely significant. And there's lots of um, uh, remnants and legacies of it. Uh, you have the cosmopolitanism of what are known as the Ajam, the non-Arabs non in Karbala. You've got the students in these places, you've got the endowments. This is a little picture of the Jami Hindi, 
uh, or Al Masjid Al Hindi in, in Najaf, which, um, you know, certainly in the uh, most of the 20th century and the later part of the 19th century was the most significant um, place of study in Najaf. Uh, you have the, the intellectual exchange, which goes both ways. And of course, you have the, the history of that period, which is then um, kept in the libraries and in the texts which have survived in India um, or South Asia generally. So, you know, one can point to things, uh, libraries like the Nasiriya and Lucknow, but also um, you have the account of uh, Sheikh Abdul Hussain Amini, uh, an Azari Iranian uh, scholar who studied in Najaf. So he's also quite cosmopolitan. <laughs> You know, the family uh, would speak uh, Turkish and uh, Arabic at home, um, uh, and still do, in fact. Um, and he wrote this huge work, Al-Ghadid, which is a, a classic kind of Shi compendium of uh, the importance of the declaration of, of Ali ibn Abi Talib as a successor of the Prophet. And, uh, you know, he, he has a text where he, he explains that he couldn't possibly have done this without... Um, his travels to India and uh, connections to uh, scholarly networks in India and access to manuscripts in India. So the modern uh, period of transnationalism has kind of forgotten some of these uh, links which are important, but uh, a fuller connected uh, Shia intellectual history has to engage in precisely these sorts of um, archaeologies. Um, thank you. Whereas, uh, I think we've momentarily lost uh, the connection with uh, Professor Rezavi. Um, there are a number of questions. Maybe we can take those sure, uh, sure. to begin with. Um, I think I'm going to begin with the first question that is, uh, can you read this on your screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Discussion. Can you tell whether Awadh state had any relationship or con connection with the Safavid Iran? I think you've taken that up. And yeah. was the Shia influence in Mughal Empire of uh, Mughal Empress Nur Jahan? Yeah, so uh, in the first case, it's very simple. Um, the Safavids were pretty much finished. Um, so you do have Safavid pretenders and uh, Safavid descendants who en actually end up in Lucknow um, and Banaras and other places. But yeah, there wouldn't have been a relationship between because the Safavid Empire came to an end in the 1720s, uh, which is really before Avid really gets going. On Nur Jahan, yes, I mean, uh, again, a lot of people have talked about it. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to, I didn't really want to focus on um, the um, the remnants at the Mughal court. I mean, there are lots of examples of um, Shia scholarly networks who are in the Mughal court. But I think what tends to happen is people, um, uh, stress this kind of link between Irani and Shi'i at the Mughal court, and it's really not that simple um, because not every Irani uh, in factional terms was uh, was uh, Shi'i and vice versa. There were very important Shi'i figures at the court who were not Iranian. Uh, they may have been from Kashmir, they may have been from other places as well. So I think uh, just focusing on the circle around Nur Jahan um, is quite limited actually. Okay. So um, another question by Ali Heather. Uh, now this is a little detailed, and I think um, yeah, um, I was he's, he's talking about Mughal Empire, and they were united in 1857, and many others um, other wars. So sectarianism divide widened in the in uh, subcontinent. Um, Ali Heather, you'll have to send us a detailed question. Can you just split it in two parts so that we can read this out? Thank you. And there is a question by Mikey Nuck. Um, uh, since the eloquent medieval uh, Persian prevalent in India is now known understandable in Iran, is there some work on Persian inscriptions and epitaph epitaphs and gravestones? I assume that the question is about inscriptions in India. Um, um, again, this is not an area I really work on. Um, there are many people who work on material culture, but uh, there are certain um, uh, compendia on these sorts of documents. So, I mean, Ziauddin Desai a long time ago did stuff on, on Western India and under the, the Gujarat Sultanate. Um, I'm sure there are works also on inscriptions in the uh, 
the Deccan. Um, but this is not something I really work on. And I, um, um, I, I did this wider question about uh, whether Persian in India was understandable to those who are not uh, in India. You know, this is classically something that Hazin complains about in the 18th century. And I think it can massively be overdone. I mean, nowadays, yes, it's true. So when, for example, Iranians try to edit texts written in Persian by uh, uh, figures in India, they often make mistakes, usually with names of places and, and even customs and certain, you know, things that uh, were found where uh, the, the Persian in India becomes inflected with the use of vernacular. Um, but then, of course, uh, Persian in all sorts of contexts is inflected with the vernacular. Um, you know, uh, Tajik gets inflected with words, words from Russian. Uh, modern Persian gets inflected with words from French, etc. So that's not so unusual. Um, but if, if someone is a serious a scholar of a pre-modern Persian, then they'll make an effort. And um, there are lexicons that you can use to make sense of, of the language. OK. So the next question is Matt Koshiki. And um, brilliant as always, regarding the Arabo-Persian cosmopolis, fully agree, needless to say. But to what extent do you see a distinction in registers between Arabic and Persian continuing through the 18th century, whereby Arabic was used to assert or perpetuate scholarly authority and Persian used to persuade a wider or courtly audience, particularly poetically? That is, to what extent to what extent do you think we should speak of the democratization of knowledge in Persian, but not in Arabic as definitive of, and I'm guessing this is Arabo-Persian cosmopolis. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Matt, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think that there's something to be said for that. Um, of course, what then also happens within this is that while you do have Arabic, which is used to, uh, to to address a wider uh, scholarly kind of um, community network. Um, at the same time, what I would say is that, you know, how do we then deal with works which mix Arabic and Persian? I mean, there are plenty of these. There are words which make, ar mix Arabic and Persian, for example, in the Safric context. So uh, people like uh, Mohsen Fais Karshani has a number of works like this. And uh, and the work I mentioned of uh, Nizamuddin Gilani, his commentary on the Nehaja Balaha. Uh, which of course is an Arabic text. Um, a lot of the commentaries in Arabic, but there are sections which are in Persian, which are very significant as well. So, uh, and there, there are many other examples of texts which mix languages um, because they know that the readership is comfortable in them. Um, one other kind of slightly more remote example is um, the Quranic commentary of uh, Ismail Haqi Burusavi in the 18th century, which is of course in Arabic, but it has large chunks in Persian, usually poetry and stories from the Masnavi and Saadi, and also has sections in Ottoman Turkish. Um, so again, it's reflective of a certain scholarly class, which is comfortable in those different languages. Um, and, and sometimes you find uh, that happening in different kinds of contexts. I mean, one text which I'm interested in at the moment, and. Uh, we're editing, I'm editing with a, a good friend, Sayyid Nizamuddin, um, is a, um, an early 18th century text called Al-Bawariq al nuriya by a guy called Ahmed um, Abdul Hamid Tabrizi, who is an Iranian who settles um, in uh, North India. He writes this text in Arabic. It's on the metaphysics, Sufi metaphysics of the school of Ibn Arabi, mixed with uh, commentaries on Shi'i hadith. Uh, but he also has a deep interest in uh, yoga Vedanta. So he talks about concepts from Sanskrit, which he um, Arabizes. He also refers to concepts in Persian. It's a wonderfully interesting text. Um, he, his finals, the final section of the text is about the, the notion of the uh, subtle substances, the uh, subtle centers, the lataif in the, the soul, which of course corresponds to the idea of the chakras. Um, and that tells you something about the way in which Sufi practice in this Arabo-Persian cosmopolis is being inflected by yogic practices. Um, that's another, I mean, that's, as I said, that's a whole area which I didn't look at, but there are so many texts which are very much part of that milieu. And a number of those texts uh, are actually part of the Shi element of that milieu. Uh, 
Right. So we have Professor Azami back with us. And um, the next question is uh, from Intact Kashmir. And I will leave Professor Azami to read that. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, talking about patronage, I was wondering about patronage offered by Indian nobles at the Mughal court to Shi ulama based in Iran. For example, we have the case of Ibrahim Khan, uh, son of, uh, it's gone missing. Can I yeah. have the... I, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I did I did mention... Oh, there it is, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, in the case of Ibrahim Khan, son of Mughal Subedar Ali Mardan Khan, who not only patronized Iranian ulama, but also sponsored their visit and compilation of a major Shi polemical work, Al Bayaz e Ibrahimi in Kashmir. Are there any other significant examples of such instances of patronage? of sectarian that is she of she nature in Mughal India? Um, yes, of course. I mean, I, I said I, I, I didn't really focus on the Mughal context um, so much. Um, uh, there are plenty of texts. There is, of course, the, the patronage of, um, of Iranians uh, coming into the court. Um, what I would kind of uh, push back on is the uh, the mention of sectarian brackets she I mean that's not the way I look at it uh, I'm I'm not particularly interested in this issue um, there are of course polemical works which are written um, you know Ihqaq al-Haq and others were written in this context but I think it would be um, misleading to consider the intellectual um, uh, production of um, these kind of connected uh, Shi ulama in uh, South Asia purely through the um, the prism of, of sectarian polemics. I mean, the vast majority of what they were doing was not that at all. They were not interested in that uh, primarily. Whether that was, of course, in the Deccan or whether it was in the North, it was very much about, yes, understanding what their tradition was. It was about engaging in the Ma'kulat, as I mentioned. Um, you know, the, the production of Polemics is one sort of work, and I, I've discussed it. I have a forthcoming article specifically on the polemics of Sayyidullah Shushtari, who you know, famously was executed um, uh, for being Shi uh, at the court of Jahangir, or you know, the reasons for that. But anyway, um, uh, so it's not just about the question of the polemics. Um, there, there's much more going on than, than polemical literature. Well, I think uh, you uh, must have answered the question by Mackie Nack. Yeah, I think we did that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, uh, the question of Matt. Yeah, we did that. That has also been done. So sorry, I mean, my network just disappeared. Even my mobile network had gone. Uh, uh, there is a question by Sabina Kazmi. Have, uh, thank right. you for a wonderful presentation. Sayyid Dildar Ali was associated with the Awadhi Nawabi regime regime's careful attempt to devise an inherently Shi entity for itself in the late 18th, uh, early 19th century. Could you tell us more about his role in this regard? Yes, yeah, so I, I did mention this, um, and I, I have an article on this, which I can refer you to, which came out in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, I, I think one of the points I would make is that uh, when he came back from Iraq, um, he was very much interested in uh, kind of trying to establish the sort of uh, theology and law that he saw in Iraq in an Avadi context. So, for example, this was uh, marked by um, uh, a rational embrace of legal probability and a, a critique of, of Ahwadis. It was um, marked by uh, an anti-Sufism, um, uh, an intolerance for Sufi practices. Um, and it was in, in, involved in a kind of polemical pushback on the foundations of the uh, philosophical theology of, of Sunnis, particularly of the Farangi Mahal, uh, which is um, expressed particularly in uh, his uh, large five volume work, Imad al-Islam. So, uh, and, and also establishing things like the Friday prayer, which was not common at this time, um, insisting upon his authority and 
the authority of his kind of um, uh, theology at the Avad court was clear. But I'm not sure it was entirely successful. Um, and, and this is something which I was indicating when I was talking about this kind of um, struggle that there's been since the 19th century between those who really want to defer to the authority of the shrine cities and those who consider that there should be kind of what you might call a local flavor of a Shi theology within an Avadi context, right? So if one looks at the actual practices, one looks at the works which were written, for example, for Vajid Ali Shah and his own works, uh, then uh, this is not uh, in line with the sort of um, uh, theology that uh, Sayyid Al Ali was promoting, or even his son, um, you know, um, Sayyid Muhammad Sultan Al Ulama or uh, Sayyid Hussain, uh, Sayyid Al Ulama. So there is a sense in which um, that process, uh, you know, set forward kind of a struggle uh, within. Um, within the sort of Shi scholarly elites and within culture about you know how you deal with these sorts of issues. Uh, well, uh, uh, Professor uh, Sajjad Rizvi, I mean, there's another question, I think. Can you tell me about the history of Daudi Bora community and their interaction with the Mughals? How do you see it as friendly? If you can tell some positive example, give some positive examples of Bohra Mughal cordial relations, then it would be helpful because Emperor Aurangzeb is set to execute Bohra leader. So I I want to know the relationship between Bohras and Mughals, especially positive relations. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> so this is not an area that I'm familiar with at all. Um, I, all I know really about Daudi Bohras, of course, is is the kind of settlement in um, in West India from from Yemen, um, but I, I'm really not familiar with um, c relations with Aurangzeb or anyone else for that matter. Um, of course, we know much more about the modern period and the relationship with the Indian state or with with the post-colonial states, but um, I, I'm not familiar with the example that's been mentioned. Uh, possibly, Ali Heather, uh, uh, this uh, whatever execution you are talking about, the bad relations between Aurangzeb and the Bohras of Gujarat, is much more uh, to deal uh, with the Mughal state and the mercantile, you know, relationships in the Gujarat region. Uh, possibly, it uh, it was due to that. Uh, nothing more. Uh, well, Sajjad Saab, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, no. For an excellent lecture, I mean, uh, going on too long, and, and I am uh, really, really, very, uh, I mean, thankful to God that my internet uh, connection went at a time when you were answering questions, and not during the time when you were actually uh, talking about the theme. Uh, I, I, at least, I gained uh, much from uh, what you had to tell us today. And we have been, uh, you know, uh, as his history students, we have been dealing with a lot of, you know, uh, these aspects which you talked about, but, but not in the fashion as you laid them out to us uh, before us today. Uh, however, there is one small query may not be related to uh, what you talked about. Uh, uh, but at, at the fag end of your, uh, you know, uh, lecture, uh, talk, you did talk about uh, the various uh, madarsas and educational institutions which grew up in uh, places like Lakhtau. Uh, uh, the Madarsa Tulvaizin and the, uh, the other uh, such seminaries. Uh, we also have certain such seminaries in uh, Meerut Muzaffar uh, Nagar region. Uh, uh, can you tell us something uh, about uh, how they were being perceived by uh, the scholars in Iran and Iraq, by those at Qom and Najaf uh, and Mashhad. Were they taken uh, seriously or what was their attitude towards those ulama who were uh, graduating from the Indian, say, for example, Lakhtav Madarsas? So I think there's a distinction here between um, like the circles of study around the figures of the Khandan Ishtihad and the Kinturis and 
for example, the Al Jazairis, which were mainly kind of um, fairly informal. And then the establishment of the formal madrasas, which really starts at the end of the 19th century, right? So you have the Sultan al Madaris, then you have the Nazimiyya, you have the Madrasul Waizin, and then you have a whole set of madrasas across North India, you know, Lahore like, has madrasas, etc. Now, by that point, um, things have changed quite dramatically. So the colonial period has had uh, enough of an impact uh, to ensure that uh, you don't necessarily have the best people going to those institutions. Um, the shrine cities themselves, you could argue, at the turn of the 20th century, do not necessarily have a very strong um, educational um, uh, context either. So um, it, it's easier to make judgments about the post-colonial context, right, in which uh, most of these madrasas across Hindustan, which of course includes Lahore and other places, um, uh, you know, are not considered to be very serious in comparison to places like Najaf and Qom. Um, however, what is happening at around 1800 and what one sees in the correspondence that we have uh, in that period between uh, people in Avad uh, and even in earlier period, people in Hyderabad and going back to the major centers of learning in Iran and Iraq, um, is that there is a much greater kind of mutual influence and mutual respect. Um, that is, is much clearer. Um, I think that that level of kind of um, interest has, has disappeared. So, you know, people would not be terribly interested in knowing what is being written um, in Lucknow today, if you're sitting in Najaf. But about 150 years ago, that was not the case. Um, and in some cases, even in the early part of the 20th century, there were still some figures who, because they were going back and forth, were important. So you think of you know people like Sayyid Ahmed Hindi, who is still a very significant figure between Lucknow and, and Najaf, um, and uh, the young uh, Sayyid Ali Naqi, Naqabi, Naqan Sahab, um, who is an important figure between the two. But it's very rare to find many other examples. Um, uh, who go beyond that. And, and certainly in the post-colonial states, um, things have been very, very different. So the, the level of scholarship is just not the same. Um, and, and since people have, I think, increasingly got, started going to the, um, the shrine cities at a much younger age, there isn't much evidence of them having studied in North India before they went, or, or Hyderabad for that matter. Um, uh, and also with respect to Hyderabad, I, I think there is um, a general kind of decline or it sets in already after the, the end of the sultanates uh, there. Um, so there is, of course, some patronage under the Nizams, but it's not um, anything like what's going on up in the north. Well, uh, thank you once again, uh, Sajjad. Uh, beautiful lecture. And uh, before uh, I hand over uh, to uh, Shagufta, a small request uh, uh, to Sajjad Rizvi Saab, and that is that uh, at some future moment of time, uh, we would request him uh, to join us once again. Uh, and this time, uh, talk about Qazi Nurullah Shustari. Uh, you know, that is a topic uh, which I had offered you, uh, yes. but uh, uh, because by that time you were quite uh, bored by this type of topic, you have written about it, you have spoken about it. But as far as we Indian historians are concerned, uh, Qazi Rula is still a very burning issue uh, with us, especially, uh, especially after uh, that uh, new source discovered uh, uh, from the period of Jahangir, with Jahangir's own comments, uh, he himself denying the fact that he did not execute uh, Qazi Durullah because of any religious causes. So hmm. after that, I think uh, our revisit to this issue of Qazi Durullah Shustari is very much needed. Uh, and so I would request you, uh, Sajjad, to uh, heed our request right. and uh, 
say sometime uh, uh, after April. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I need to actually go back and look at that further. Um, I'm, I'm actually more interested now in his theology. Um, yes. There is, a, there is actually a wonderful PhD being done on him right now at Harvard uh, by Shavar Shavan. So um, he will, I think, have something for, more interesting to say on that aspect. But um, I do need to also look at the... Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced by uh, the Majalis being a, a big um, change. Um, but anyway... We'll, oh, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't tell us anything new, really, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. We could we could definitely go back to uh, Sayyid Nulla. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And thank you very much, Shagufta. Please, uh, the thank future you. programs and yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Sajjad Sal. And what a better time than the birth anniversary week of uh, one of the Persian Sanskrit and Braj scholars and influential Shia nobleman of India. And uh, this is I'm talking about Abdul Rahim Khanikana. And so someone we all grew up reading in school and of course we respect him and this is the time when we have a uh, asha ganga jamini um talk uh, coming up in january on um abdul rahim um focusing on abdul rahim um for ganga jamini asha and particularly myself it is a subject closer to my heart um that what i would have imagined at the start of the discussion now um there's so many threads from our earlier talks that crossed and connected today um it was where it was only yesterday that one of our guests, Professor Tahir Kamran uh, from Pakistan, had marveled at how Persian is still alive in India. While it does surprise, nothing gives us more pleasure than to learn that ideas and manuscripts have somehow survived and thrived, something that you brought out so beautifully in your section of the Dakhan. Thank you also for shedding light on intellectuals like Nizam Adil Gilani and Sheikh Bahai. Not long ago, we had on the page of Ganga Jamni initiated a discussion on an illustrated copy of Sheikh Bahal Nan and Nan al Halwa originating in the mm -hmm. Indian Dakhan. There is another connection here today. Mullah Sadda <laughs> was also one of the murids of Sheikh Bahai. And it's incidentally the handle of Professor Rizvi on Twitter. And um, <laughs> so I've informed everyone here, if you want to follow him, um, he is um, known as Mullah Sadra mm -hmm. on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say that we started um, earlier this year mm -hmm. with uh, the focus on Shia practices in the Qasbahs. And Professor Rizavi here obliged us with a wonderful illustrated talk. And we don't get to hear more mm -hmm. of that, that kind of research mm -hmm. so often. So we want, I want to thank uh, Professor Rezavi for that. And this is such a beautiful connection and the thread just goes on. Um, for the next week's programs, um, Friday 25th, uh, that's Christmas at 7 p.m. is going to be the popular historian Rana Safi who will speak on a shared festival in the Mughal capital city. This is not Christmas. Um, Saturday, uh, Saturday 26th at 7 p.m. We have a food historian Salma Hussain, who will be in conversation with Sohail Hashmi Sahib about uh, the Padshah's table, Mughal Dastakhan. And um, this will be followed by a walk uh, with a Mughal themed um, you know, um, food uh, on the 27th. Then we have um, on Sunday, the 27th, um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Catherine Schofield, who will be talking about Mughal's mm -hmm. music and film. So you can be sure that there'll be Mughalayazam um, in that as well. So I uh, just want to thank you all again and um, words of praise and um, lots of words of um, praise coming in for uh, Professor Rizvi and uh, want to thank you and close this evening by thanking you again, both of you for having hosted this absolutely beautiful session, uh, which connected so many threads. And as I said, that um, these are topics that are rarely discussed. Um, and um, thank you for that great scholarship. So have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we want to thank you for being our wonderful, constant, consistent audience. And um, hope to see you next weekend. Good night. Good night.